You can open your Bible again to the prophet Malachi. I almost said you can open your Bible for the last time to Malachi. And that's true for our series in the book, but hopefully not true for the rest of your life. Malachi chapter 3, the last little bit, and then chapter 4 is what we'll look at today. The closing words of the Old Testament. And though the last book of the Old Testament is a heavy, weighty message of doom, it's an oracle, and though the very last word of the Old Testament is going to be one of the harshest words in the Old Testament, the closing section of the Old Testament is incredibly and overwhelmingly positive. Positive. Except for a few glimpses of this great positive perspective that we saw in chapter 3, a little bit, a few glimpses, this book for the most part has been overwhelmingly negative. It started with the word, the oracle, the message of doom. It ends with the word, curse, or ban, or destruction. The nation of Israel had returned from exile, returned from judgment. They were being restored by God to the promised land. And you thought everything would be wonderful, and yet you find everything is really bad. They're back from judgment. They're in the promised land. The temple has been rebuilt. They're sacrificing again. Their priests are preaching again. Their hope is again in the coming messenger of the covenant, the Messiah. And yet, if you look at each key verse of each key chapter of each chapter, you realize that though everything is working again and worship is back in the promised land and the temple and everything seems to be working, God is not pleased. They're sacrificing again, but one verse ten says, Oh that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Their preachers were preaching again in chapter 2, but look what God said about the preachers. Verse 8 of chapter 2. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all people. Inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Chapter 3, their hope was again in the coming Messiah, the one in whom they delight, it said. A glimpse of positivity again. And yet, 3 verse 5 says, I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a witness against you on that day when the Messiah comes. And so this oracle of Malachi really shakes them up. They thought they're doing all the right things in all the right ways, and Malachi comes and shakes things up and says, no, you don't. 2 verse 17, the anchor verse of the book. You have wearied Yahweh with your words. This all is worship that wears God out. And over the last few weeks, we have seen what it was in those wonderful worship activities, but what it was that proved that worship to be false, superficially great, but inwardly pagan. Now, the closing section of the book is the solution to all that. It's the wonderful end. It's the fix to all that is wrong in the worship of Israel on that day. Oh, it's so relevant for our own time where our own worship and Christianity, broadly speaking, is exactly the same as it was in the days of Malachi. We're gathering for worship every Sunday with preachers who are preaching. We are remembering the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Our hope is in the second coming of Christ. We love and we have praise and worship and we sing and we love Jesus and we open the Bible and yet we fall in the same traps as they did in that day. And so the fix to their worship at the end of Malachi year is equally a fix for Christian worship in our day, and obviously for our own hearts individually too. So let's read this closing section together, and then we'll get to the solution to worship that wears God out, the solution to it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Then those who feared Yahweh spoke with one another. 
Yahweh paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared Yahweh and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogance and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says Yahweh of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, O oh, the Son of Righteousness shall rise, with healing in its wings. You shall go out, leaping like calves from the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says Yahweh of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Our worship, though great superficially, often falls short of true worship because of three different reasons. And those three reasons are finally addressed here at the end of Malachi. A summary of all the wrong worship in Christianity today can fall into these three categories. We have a wrong understanding of salvation, we have a wrong understanding of judgment day, and we have a wrong understanding of repentance. Think about that for a moment. If you think of Christian worship, the worship of Christianity today, very, very few Christians think of it in terms of those three words, do they? How would you describe the worship of your church today? We, we don't tend to say things like it was the worship of those who have been saved by God and they're living righteously and they fear the Lord. We don't say things like that. We're like, oh, the, the, the preaching was amazing uh, and the singing stirred my heart. And I couldn't just help but, but rejoice as I walked out of the church building that day. It really ministered to my needs. How many of us, when asked, how was your church service today, say, you know, it was just a great reminder of how God is going to bring justice on the world and how we who fear Him will thankfully be on His side. We don't describe our worship in terms of Judgment Day, do we? We have a wrong understanding of worship because we have a wrong understanding of repentance also. <laughs> And so everybody is welcome to worship, and it's just wonderful how diverse our group is. We have righteous people, we have wicked people, it doesn't matter. We have people who believe God's Word, we have people who don't believe God's Word. Isn't it amazing how we can all gather together for worship? Everyone's welcome. We have a wrong understanding of salvation, a wrong understanding of judgment, and a wrong understanding of repentance, and then we come together and we worship God and think it's wonderful. With m m we, I mean broad Christianity. Okay? We have to examine our hearts to see if we are perhaps like that too. And these three things finally get fixed here at the end of Malachi's oracle of doom. And so we have three wonderful corrections to our worship. Three wonderful calls to correct our worship. It's really a passage that, that demands a response. So calls to correct our worship. The first call to correct our worship then is to correct our view of salvation. And we do it by looking to the God-fearers. If you want to fix your worship and make sure your worship is pleasing the Lord, then look to the God-fearers to understand salvation. We need to fix our view of salvation. Okay? It's crucially important. Now, there's a couple ways you can fix your view of salvation. You can do this grand systematic theology study of words like propitiation, because not even an English dictionary word barely is. 
uh, regeneration, predestination. You can even throw an unbiblical word in, Calvinism, and go study it, historical theology. You can throw in the topics of evangelism and prayer and confession and forgiveness. You can throw in all those words, or very simply, like Malachi does, you can simply say, let's talk about the fear of the Lord. And then spell fear with a capital F and Lord with a capital L-O-R-D. The fear of Yahweh, the fear of the great Creator God who sustains all by His tremendous love and grace. Chapter 3, verse 16 to 18 did exactly that, right? Then those who feared Yahweh spoke with one another. Oh, that's such a wonderful phrase in this, this oracle. You can imagine Malachi speaking to the nation, and all of them are worshiping falsely in all the bad ways that we saw in the past few weeks. And then there was a little group in the far back that formed. And it was all those who feared the Lord. They found each other, and they started speaking to one another. Yahweh paid attention to them, that little corner in the back. That's where God was looking. That's the worship He was accepting. He heard them. A book of remembrance was written before God of those who feared the Lord. Those in the back corner, their names were written in that book. They shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. What is God's treasured possession? It is those who fear the Lord. I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Some famous descriptions of the fear of the Lord found in the rest of the Old Testament. Worship that God pays attention to. Worship that God listens to and accepts when it comes up into his throne room is the worship of those who fear Yahweh. Fear the Lord. Too often, like Israel and Malachi's day, as we saw in the first three chapters, we define true worshipers by, by God loves us. I know I'm a true worshiper because God loves me. I know I'm a true worshiper because God understands my struggles, and He understands why I sometimes don't worship so wonderfully and perfectly. Or I know I'm a true worship because our pastor has such wonderfully encouraging messages. It doesn't matter what I did that week. I come back from church and the pastor encouraged me. I know I'm a true worshiper because um, God wants us to be happy in our families and in our marriages. I know I'm a true worshiper because everyone is accepted. We don't judge others. We're all happy together. Everyone's welcome. And God wants us to be successful. And so I know I'm a true worshiper. We literally say things like that in Christianity. Where in all of this is the fear of the Lord? And with fear of the Lord, you really have to say it with a smile on your face. <laughs> okay, it's just so wonderful. Where in all of this is that wonderful gathering of those who feared the Lord and get together and speak about worship? We need to return the fear of God to our worship. That's verse 16. Verse 17 adds the concept of redemption, salvation. They shall be mine. If you want to describe how salvation works, that is when God makes you His. They shall be mine. They will make up my treasured possession. Oh, that's rich Old Testament terminology. Okay, that's what God did when He redeemed Israel out of Egypt. He says, they'll be my treasured possession, not your slave ministry. I'm going to make of them something beautiful and wonderful. And they go to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, same mountain, different names. And he makes them his treasured possession. And then he brings them to his promised land. And he makes them flourish there, especially under the reign of David and Solomon. Yet, like Israel, we're quick to claim the title, God's loved ones, God's treasure, but neglect the terms and conditions that come with it. Just before the Ten Commandments, at that great momentous event when God officially and formally and even legally made them His treasured possession, just before the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 19 verse 5 He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey My voice and keep My covenant, you shall be My treasured possession among all the nations of the earth. Deuteronomy 7, a very significant use of this treasured possession concept. 
It's significant, Deuteronomy 7, to Malachi, because in Deuteronomy 7, God had just told them, do not marry those who worship false gods. A big thing in Malachi's day, right? And then in verse 6, just after that, it says, For you are a people holy, set apart to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. Don't you now go and step out of the treasured possession category by marrying those who are not part of His treasured possession? (laughs) See, you can only claim to be God's treasure if you're actually His treasure. And you can only know that you're his treasure if you're actually living holy. It's kind of the definition of his treasured possession. You are holy. You're set apart. You're not the one who does what they do. You can't love God's blessing and consider yourself his treasured possession if you hate his holiness. End of Deuteronomy. Wrapping up everything that God has revealed to Israel. It says this, Deuteronomy 26, verse 18 and 19. The Lord has declared to you today that you are a people for His treasured possession as He promised you, and that you are to keep all His commandments, and that you are to be a people holy to the Lord your God as He promised. We have to, when we think of worship and being God's people and being the worshipers of God, we have to quickly attach to it. That means we're living holy. No wonder Malachi 3 verse 16 talks about the God fear. 17 talks about this redemption, treasured possession thing. And then verse 18 is all about the distinction. Well, we love the status, but we hate the distinction. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. This is the grand purpose statement of Malachi. The big problem verse of the whole book was 2 verse 17. The grand purpose statement is 3 verse 18. Then once again there will be a distinction between true and false worshipers between those who are truly God's treasure and those who are righteous and those who serve Him and those who are actually not His treasure at all. They just think they are, but they are wicked and they do not even serve God. This is the hoped-for outcome of all Malachi's preaching that, that year to them. God will make the distinction between the righteous and the wicked very, very clear. God will make the distinction between those who serve Him and those who do not serve Him very, very clear. And so just as a little implication for Christianity today, you can ask yourself, does your worship of God, of the true living God, does your worship of Him muddle that distinction or clarify that distinction? It's a simple taste of true worship, especially in a church setting. Do we help make that distinction clear that God is one day going to make stunningly clear, or do we muddle it up as much as we can? God will make it clear. There will be no muddling of it on Judgment Day. And the question is, on which side are you going to be? Which side of God's separation will you be on? It's not your separation. You don't decide. God does it. We see this phrase, serves him, uh, 17, it's that illustration, he's going to spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Okay, think of a businessman who's grooming his son to take over his business. Obviously, that businessman isn't going to kill his son. Okay, he serves them, they work together. But then in verse 18, he makes it very clear, we're actually talking about the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. Now, serve is such a nice worship term, isn't it? Uh, We came together to serve the Lord. What does it mean? Well, I served God. That's, that's what it means. <laughs> a serve is, is a, it's a work term. Okay? It's, it's not as much a worship, praise and worship kind of coming together a church term as much as it is an employment term, even a slavery term. Okay? It's work. Then once more you shall see the distinction between one who works for God and one who does not work for God. We love to hang around God as a good friend for sinners, but do you work for Him? We love a loving Father God, 
But do you actually understand he's also your commanding officer? Do you work for God, or is God just there for your needs? When, when your personal church convictions and your personal worship preferences and your other life responsibilities, for example, clash with some of God's expectations, which one do you serve? Your expectations or God's expectations? Jesus made it clear, right? You cannot serve two masters because you're always going to love the one and neglect the other, even hate the other. Do you work for God? Now, perhaps the most famous, I serve God, I work for God, statement in church history was given by a pastor in Smyrna, the little town of Smyrna, you can read about it in Revelation, actually. In Smyrna, in about 160 AD, so that's, what is that, about 70 years after Revelation was written. At that time, Polycarp was the pastor of Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, and he was also the last surviving man who had personally interacted with the apostles of Jesus Christ. He was a young man when the apostle John passed away and was famous because he had been taught by the apostle John. At age 86, Polycarp was threatened with death by wild animal or by burning for believing in Jesus Christ. It was kind of escalated from um, you'll die by wild animal to you'll die by burning for believing in Jesus Christ. This is what the wise old pastor said to the court that day. It says, 86 years I have served Christ. I have served Christ. I've worked for Christ. 86 years I've served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King and my Savior? That's a great question to throw back to the court. Okay, it doesn't make sense for me to blaspheme God. It makes no sense to do what you say. Because I am working for God, and I've worked for God for 86 years, and He's only ever been perfect and good to me. Okay, it's just stupid for you to ask me to deny Him. That is what serve God does to you. I have always worked for God, and He is such a perfect master with such perfect instructions and expectations. Why would I stop now just because somebody else expects something different from me? Yeah, you know, but my week was busy, and now there's things that happen at work and at school and things. Um, so the expectations of my life for my Saturday, Sunday morning time is a bit different, so I just have to change things. Why? <laughs> I work for God, and He's not like my boss who's brutal and cruel and unthankful. You see, when God makes the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who work for Him and those who do not work for Him, the question is, on which side are you actually? Up to now, Malachi talked about sacrifices and praise and worship and preachers and opening God's Word and the hope of Messiah coming with bringing justice. But now he says, forget all that. That's all somewhat superficial issues that have big problems in your day. If you want to understand whether you're a true or false worshiper, ask whether you're siding with the God-fearers who work for God or if you're siding with, well, whatever you want. Verse 16 drew our attention to those who fear God. Verse 17 added the concept of salvation and redemption to our thinking, only for verse 8 then to say, this is the outcome of it all. And so, if you want to correct your worship, then you have to correct your view of salvation. And if you want to correct your view of salvation, you're going to have to understand what it means to fear God. Because that determines the final outcome. People saved by God will work for God and will fear God. Make that your WhatsApp status this week. People saved by God will work for God with a fear of God. That clarifies much, doesn't it? The fear of the Lord helps us understand 
salvation. But there's a second call to correct our worship in this closing section of Malachi. The second call to correct our worship is to look to the day of separation if you want to understand justice. Oh, we have such a messed up view of justice, right? We have a very, very strange view of justice in this world. We're just like those little kids who say, it's not fair to their parents when their chocolate is smaller than the brother's chocolate. It's not fair. You've got chocolate. <laughs> okay, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, you don't deserve chocolate. And now you've got a piece that's smaller than your brother's, and you whine and complain, saying, it's not fair. <laughs> okay, we're, we're such a messed up view of justice. We're ungrateful. We're always on the right side of justice ourselves for some reason, and other people are always on the other side. If you want to understand justice biblically, then consider the day of separation. Now, we know that this separation already. We just read about it in verse 18. But chapter 4, verse 1 in our Bibles begins with, For behold. For, because. Everything I set up to now is going to happen that way because of something. And that because something is a behold thing. Okay, behold. Just one word all by itself with an exclamation point at the end. Great English translation there. Calls your attention to look up and listen. This is, this is when the, the preacher says, says, look up, make eye contact. I've got something amazing to tell you. For behold, the day is coming. Finally, the day is coming. Chapter 2, verse 17, they ask, where is the God of justice? Chapter 4, verse 8 says, First 4 verse 1 says, it is coming. It is coming. Burning like an oven when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. That day is coming. It will set them ablaze, says Yahweh of hosts, so that it will leave neither root nor branch. What a wonderful day, right? But for you, fear my name. The Son of Righteousness shall shine with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like cows from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says Yahweh of hosts. <clears throat> now, the outcome of the day of separation we already saw. That was 3 verse 18. Okay, distinction will be made. That's the outcome. So we're kind of working backwards in time here. And he keeps doing that for the rest of this chapter. We started with the outcome of the day of separation. Now we move back a little bit to the actual day of separation. The best description of this day, though, is there in verse 3. The day when I act, says Yahweh. There's a great description in verse 5 as well. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. The great and fearful day of the Lord comes. The great day when everybody will fear God, at least in a justice sense, if not in a love sense. This is the end times. This is when God comes to fix the problems on earth. They asked in 2 verse 17, when is that day coming? Because it's been prophesied by all the prophets. And Malachi says, actually, I'm going to be the last prophet, it seems, and let me tell you, it's coming. <laughs> it's on the horizon. We can see it. Let me tell you about it. The day of justice is coming. Now, to understand justice, we tend to compare ourselves to one another. I know it's right and wrong because I'm right, and I look at you, and you're better than me, so you're right, but you're worse than me, so you're wrong. Or we, we say uh, silly things like, um, we're going to aim for the greater good, as though a good outcome justifies a bad method. Or the lesser evil. Okay, everything is bad, so just pick the worst of all the, ev or the best of all the evils. Or you make yourself the best critic of world events, especially sports events. Okay, every couched sportsman knows they're the best critic on the game. Okay? That's our view of justice. It's not right that, that the referee did that, that the politician did that, because we know you are not the standard of justice. Think about that at the next game, sitting there and you disagree with what the referee did. Sit there thinking, huh, I wonder what he knows that I don't know. Ever thought that? 
Yeah, we just don't. Our view of justice is so tied to the little circle in the middle that says me. And we even do that when it comes to the issue of final justice from God on all mankind. Oh, God should, God should just put an end to the evil people, all those wicked, wicked people in this world. And we all say amen, and that's a great desire. But you need to start thinking, where is that little circle me on that spectrum? It's not in the middle. It's not the differing, the deciding factor in everything. It's just placed somewhere, and God knows where it is, and He's going to act according to that. Verse 1, all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. And before you say, praise the Lord, you should say, I was once arrogant. I once did something evil. It doesn't say some of the arrogant and most of the evildoers. It says all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. Ever been arrogant or done evil? Then you will be stubble. Verse 1, you will leave them neither root nor branch. There's nothing left. The day of perfect justice will need no appeal. Nobody's going to come out the other end with, okay, I'm still here. There's nothing left. All of you went into a courtroom. All of you went out the same door. There's no appeal. There's no comeback. There's no extenuating excuses. There's no complaints. There's no review process. It's perfect. It's just. We saw this already in chapter 3, verse 2, right? 3, verse 1, same thing. Behold, He is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. 3, verse 2, but who can endure the day of His coming? Who can stand when He appears? For He is like a refining fire and like a fuller soap. Who can stand? And before you say, I can, Remember, God is a purifier. So all evil needs to go. In other words, if you want justice, and we should want justice, at least recognize that nobody will stand. But, this is the positive part of the book, verse 2. But for you, fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. God, I don't think you get a better picture of just exuberant happiness and joy than calves leaping from a stall. Guys, I was in North America for, uh, for a year working on a farm, and they put all the cattle inside for the winter because it's freezing cold outside. And that first day of spring that you open that door, I was working at a dairy farm. Production goes way down that day. They're not making milk that day. They're running. They're having fun. There's still a bit of snow in some patches on the grass, but the grass is green and growing already. The sun is shining warmly. Uh, they, they scamper across that entire field the entire day. You fix fences that evening. <laughs> okay? There's joy. We're out. It's freedom. This is a day of separation. There are this group, and then there's but that group. Verse 1, destruction to all who were arrogant and did something evil. Verse 2, impeccable, joyful, freeing deliverance to, for all who fear the Lord and are righteous. And then verse 3 goes a step further and says, let's see how these two groups relate to each other. Verse 3, you shall tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I access Yahweh of hosts. It's a day of separation, but there's still a relationship. Those whom the Lord redeems and frees are actually acting as the judges of those who are evil. And so the distinction is strikingly clear because they're right next to each other. If you put a, a white paper and a black paper on opposite sides of the rooms, you're like, okay, there, there's a distinction, I see it. But put them right next to each other, well, now you see how big the distinction really is. Now, there's a very important change of wording in verse 2. It still talks about those who fear my name, as we saw in chapter 3. We still talk about the righteous who are there, the righteousness that they, they live by. But notice the change of whom he's talking to. In chapter 3, he says, 
Those who feared the Lord. Verse 17, they shall be mine when I spare them. Then once more you will see the distinction. So end of chapter 3, you are not the God-fearer. You're just a third-party observer, understanding what's going to happen. But now in 4 verse 2, he says, but for you who fear my name. You see, nobody can stand in Judgment Day. All of us are arrogant and evil doers. And yes, 3 verse 16 to 18 talked about the righteous God fears, but now that's just a hypothetical group. It's not a realistic group anymore. And the verse 2 says, actually, you can be that group. It is not just hypothetical. Yes, you can't become that group on your own. It's going to be the day that I act that I make that distinction, and then you will be those who fear my name. And God does that work in you. We saw that in chapter 3 already. He will purify you. He will make you holy and righteous. But you can be in that blessed group of verse 2, going out like joyful cattle from the stall, scampering around in joyful freedom and righteousness and holiness for all eternity. You don't need to be a Christian who has a warped sense of worship like those in Malachi's day. You you no longer need to be a Christian who compromises with a life of obedience. Uh, You can obey. You can be a God-fearer. You don't have to be this Christian with a distorted view of justice. You, You can put into that view. You don't have to be one of those who throng along in the crowds of Christian worship but have no understanding of justice. You can be the one who fears God. It's possible. You don't have to stay that way. You can change. You see, our worship is often so wrong, but it doesn't have to stay that way. You and I, every single Christian around us, all of us can correct our worship. And we don't have to change the perfection of God's justice to be accepted by Him. We just have to change our view of worship. We have to affirm that, yes, we are on the wrong side of justice. We have to repent of our sins, and we have to ask God to refine us and make us holy. Then we will be in the crowd of those who spoke to one another, fearing the Lord. Life as we know it now feels very much like every man does what's right in his own eyes. But a day is coming when God will act. It will be a day of separation with perfect justice. And you don't have to continue in the category where you're definitely on the wrong side of justice. You can ask God to purify you and teach you the fear of the Lord. Because the outcome of that day we already saw in verse 18. There will be a very clear distinction between the righteous and those who serve God and the wicked and those who do not serve God. So to understand how God saves people, look to the God-fearers. To understand how God judges people, look to that day of separation when the distinction will be made. And the third call then to correct our worship is to look to the Scriptures to understand repentance. Salvation, justice, repentance. Those are the three words that we need to use to describe true worshipers. Third, therefore, look to the Scriptures to understand repentance. Some lovely verses here at the end. 4 verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Then a bit of a separate thought. Behold, look up and listen. Final statement of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. These last verses of the entire Old Testament fit in with this last section. And they point you to the entire Old Testament going on on before it, to all of it before. You have that twofold, famous twofold division, the law and the prophets. 
the law and the prophets. You've got Moses and you've got Elijah, the icon, personal icon of the law and the personal icon of the prophets, Moses and Elijah. Now, what is the gospel according to Moses? If you would read Genesis to Deuteronomy, Moses, what would you conclude is the gospel message? Well, it's very, very clear. You go through all those little laws on obedience and things like that, the civil laws, uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments, for example, everything else that's in there. And what you realize very quickly is that all those laws, when you put them together, are merely a fully written out standard of holiness. You never, ever need to wonder again what is right or what is wrong. One of the most amazing gifts given to a nation in that time. God even made that point. It's like, what kind of nation is there that has a God that does this, that just tells you up front what he expects? So the law of Moses and its purpose is to define and require holiness and by very explicit implication to make you realize you are not holy. And then, third purpose of the law, very clearly stated in the law of Moses repetitively, is to drive you to God to change you. It sets the standard of holiness. That's typically what we think of when we think of the law of Moses. That one we are familiar with. It makes you feel like you're not holy. We're very familiar with that too. But then, an understated but very overt purpose of the law of Moses is to drive you to God who can change you. Moses in Deuteronomy ends his, his repeating of the law with a gospel call. Genesis chapter 4, the very first set of events recorded after the sin of mankind, is God sharing the gospel with Cain. It culminates in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and chapter 30, the two famous gospel presentations. Just listen to these words. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 to 13. Moses is speaking to Israel just before the promised land. He's preaching to them. He says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? And you're like, wow, there's literally books written on that. Okay? Listen to his answer, though. But, this is all, fear the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, love him, and serve the Lord your God. It's concepts we saw here, fear and serve, two of the, the summary things of the law. Verse 20 of Deuteronomy 10, you shall fear Yahweh your God, you shall serve him, and you will hold fast to him. That endearing run to God picture in the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, Yahweh your God will circumcise your hearts. God will change you so that you will love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 8, you shall again obey the voice of Yahweh and keep all His commandments. God will change you and you will be righteous. You must obey, but you can't, the law says. So run to God and He will change your heart so that you can love and obey. That's the gospel, isn't it? Exactly the same as what we know to be after Jesus Christ. Run to Jesus Christ. He will forgive your sins that you know you have committed because you don't obey, and He will help you obey. That's verse 4 here. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb or Sinai for all Israel. Go remember Moses' point. You're sinful. You need to be holy. God can make you holy. That's the gospel according to Moses, the law. What's the gospel according to the prophets? Verse 5 and 6. Behold, I sent you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The prophets. <clears throat> now, this prophecy, behold, Elijah is coming. It's given after Elijah, because okay, so we know it's not not the stories in Kings. This is a prophecy that's still awaiting its fulfillment. But there was a little preview of how it could possibly be fulfilled one day in a man named John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the greatest of prophets. What was John the Baptist's message? Remember? 
Matthew 3, verse 1 and 2, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. His first word, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold, Elijah's coming. He's going to turn the hearts, repentance, because the day is coming. To the religious unbelievers, John the Baptist said, Matthew 3, verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't think you're fine just because you know Abraham. It's the point of Malachi. Don't just think you're fine because you're in the promised land again. You need to fear the Lord. You need to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. John chapter 3, verse 28 and 30. I am not the Christ, John the Baptist says, but I've been sent before him. He must increase, I must decrease. What was the gospel according to John the Baptist? Repent, obey, live holy, and Jesus is coming, look to him. Repent, obey, see Jesus. But the fulfillment of Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6 is about the coming of the prophet Elijah at the end times. It wasn't quite fulfilled in the days of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist has that clear link to this prophecy. Everybody thought he was that Elijah, and yet it was clear that he also wasn't that Elijah. And so it's still coming. What's his message going to be at the end times? Well, verse 6 says he's going to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. It's an odd little statement, but again, it's repentance terminology. That turn is the word for repent. They didn't have a word for repent. They just used the word turn. Sometimes I think we have to return to that. We have to return to that. <laughs> repent and come back to that terminology. I have turned from my sins. I've turned to the Lord. John or Elijah coming at the end times is going to cause the people to repent. Here specifically, it, it phrases it as turn the heart, so that's repentance. But it says, of the children to their fathers and the, ch the fathers to their children. And you're like, why does he do that? Why isn't it between them and God? Why is it between each other? Because one of the major issues that we saw in Malachi, especially chapter 2, was fathers who are Jewish, bringing their kids up in the fear of the Lord and temple worship, are now divorcing their Jewish wives and marrying women who do not fear the Lord and having kids with them. Guess the fastest way to kill Christianity in one generation. What is it? It's that. <laughs> okay? Separate the faith of the fathers from the instruction to the children, and you will kill Christianity in a generation. One generation. You see it, right? Parents who occasionally come to church, their kids never come to church when they're adults. It's not that our, we can save our kids or our kids are saved by the faith of their father. But if you have fathers separating to worship idols from their kids who are brought up in the fear of the Lord, well, you're going to kill the faith in one generation. But if you can restore the fathers to their children, which is what Malachi called for, he says you cannot go marry those women, you cannot divorce your Jewish women, Wives, get back to them. Well, then there's hope of Messiah coming. We saw that all in chapter 2 already. Messiah cannot be born if the Jewish nation fails completely. That's why in, in Matthew, when we meet Mary and, and Joseph, we find out there are still God-fearing Jews. And Messiah is born to them. He will cause the people to repent. He will, he will cause those who have, have kind of snuffed out the knowledge of true faith, He will cause them to reconcile so that the fathers will repent and so the children will know what repentance looks like. So be it Moses repeatedly so, or the prophets of the Old Testament and the New Testament and the future, the message of the gospel is a message of repentance, turning people back to God, and thereby turning them back to the gospel perpetuating into all generations. Every one of us who considers ourselves to be true worshipers must examine our worship in terms of repentance. How do you understand repentance? Well, look to the law and the prophets. Turn to the Scriptures to understand repentance and then evaluate your worship. 
And so the oracle, the message of doom of Malachi, and so the entire Old Testament ends with, lest I come and strike the land with a ban. It's probably the best translation, a curse, a decree of utter destruction, as the ESV says. This is the same word, that's why it's, it's a strong word, it's a, it's a decree of utter destruction. Okay, it's strong, it's purposeful, it's a decree, it's by destruction and it's complete annihilation. That's the word God used with the nation of Israel when they were about to enter the promised land and God says, I'm giving the land to you and I'm placing a ban, a decree of utter destruction on all the pagan Canaanites because they still haven't repented after all these years. What God had promised to the Canaanites when Israel entered the promised land, God is now directing at the Israelites in the promised land. That's a striking message reminding you that, oh, the, oh it's so wonderful with correct worship. This is an oracle of doom. God is going to do to you, think you're fine because you're God's people. God is going to do to you what He did with one of the most obvious examples of the most horrific kind of paganism the Canaanites, when the Isra Israelites entered the Promised Land. Lest I come and strike the land with that same ban all over again, but now you're the recipients. Lest is a nice word there. <laughs> okay, it's a warning. It's not yet a decree. <laughs> it's a warning. Correct your worship. But the last word of Malachi is ban. The strongest curse words, destruction words in Old Testament. It started with oracle was the first word, a message of doom. It ends with, well, doom. Why? You have to ask yourself why. Just step back a bit and say, why would God send a message like this, oracle ban, to the nation of Israel who had just come back from exile, had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, had rebuilt the temple, were worshiping again? Why would he send them this message? It seems so negative. Well, as we saw in these four chapters, it is because they had turned their worship of God into worship that wears God out. Chapter 1, they were quick to claim God's love while despising His glory and making worship all about themselves. Chapter 2, they were quick to change the standard for preachers so that they could continue their own ways. Chapter 3, they were quick to fail in personal holiness in order to succeed in earthly prosperity. That is why God sent them this message. Such worship wears God out. It does not get God's blessing. And so, closing this prophecy, God offered them these ways to correct their worship. Look to the God-fearers to understand salvation and judge your worship by that. Look to the day of separation to understand justice and judge your worship by that. Look to the Scriptures to understand repentance and evaluate your worship by that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have indeed evaluated our worship by this today. But may it not just stay with us till the end of this prayer, maybe until home group even, when we discuss it again. But may it settle down deep in our hearts and burn within us a, a fear of God, and burn within us a desire to call all those who are friends and family members who do not yet understand these messages, that they too can understand these. Oh Lord, save those who are in Christian churches and yet are the, well, the recipients of this letter in many ways, this prophecy. Keep our worship pure, Lord. May we not depart from Your ways. May we hold each other accountable. May we stir each other up to love and good deeds. May we be faithful because the day is coming and the day of separation will be very, very firm and final. Oh Lord, thank You that You have put in us a new heart. Thank You that You've clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. Thank You that we 
have been convicted of our sins, that we have repented of our sins and false worship that we have committed for way too long in our lives. And Lord, thank you that you've redeemed us, saved us, put us in the category of those who fear God. Oh Lord, what a tremendous, joyful privilege it is. May we, as it were, go out of this with, with a joy as calves skipping out of the stall after a long winter. And may we rejoice in the coming of Christ again to redeem us from all evildoers and the arrogant. Lord, what a hope we have. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.